of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, June 14th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today... Staff writer at The Atlantic, author of the narrative nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, a reckoning with the history of slavery across America. Clint Smith will be joining us. Also, Joe, Joe Biden at the G7 in Europe meets with Putin. Speaking of the G7, it agrees on a 1 billion dose vaccine pledge to poorer, low-income nations across the world, leaving us just shy, just 10 billion vaccine doses shy of where we need to be. Meanwhile, the DOJ announces it will ramp up voting rights enforcement, but will it be enough without new law Trump DOJ subpoenaed Apple to give up information on Trump's very own lawyer and bye bye BB but will it be frying pan into the fire with new Israeli Prime Minister Niftali Bennett George W. Bush judge in Wisconsin halts the USDA debt relief payments to black farmers. Pro-democracy groups offer a warning. Keiko Fujimori's election steal attempts from Pedro Castillo. <clears throat> Senator John, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Ron Johnson suspended by YouTube for still promoting hydroxychloroquine. Remember that oldie? And latest report, nearly all people hospitalized for COVID now are unvaccinated. Probably just a coincidence. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Starting the uh, week off a little bit early uh, on Monday, uh, just because we're, that's our new up and atom spirit that we have around here. Emma Viglin, I'm glad you uh, you seem to have that uh, that up and atom spirit today. Yeah, I'm energized. Yeah, I love Mondays. Mondays are great. Mondays Especially are great. when we start early. Yes, exactly. I'm well, actually doing all right, though. What we're going to do is we're just going to dial this back, and we're just going to keep starting earlier and earlier. And uh, the idea is that until we're until I be, quit, until <laughs> until we're all gone. Um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we are still in the midst. Uh, Joe Biden is, of course, uh, in Europe now, and in his absence, and you know, it, it occurred to me that maybe this isn't quite a uh, coincidence the administration knew that it was heading out, out of town uh, for these European talks <clears throat> with the G7 and um, they want the momentum or the lack of momentum I guess for the infrastructure bill uh, to be to continue on so why not leave it with 10 senators uh, five Republicans five Democrats who of course um, don't have the ability to to pass anything because we need 10 Republicans to sign on to anything without a filibuster reform. So, I mean, it, it really seems to be, um, I, I don't know, like theater. 
uh, maybe is that the word I'm looking for or just a, a, a huge waste of time? Or, um, you know, self-congratulatory, masturbatory nonsense that as well. There, I think that's all uh, rolled into it. I mean, that's that's not necessarily the image that I wanted to sort of put out there. But um, if that's uh, if that if that's yeah, that works as well. <laughs> um, I uh, and, and so we have a gang of 10. And. I think I mentioned this on uh, Friday, the Adam G- uh, Gentleson had a uh, great uh, tweet thread about this. He's the guy who wrote the book about um, the filibuster and um, giving a sort of a brief history of gangs of. And it never works out well for the Democrats. Um, It never works out well. Hopefully, and I don't know how this one, I mean, you know, like I say, the idea that there's going to be five other Republican senators in addition to the five who agree with whatever they come up with that are going to vote for this bill just seems to me to be absolute nonsense. Uh, I I find it hard to believe that all five of these uh, Republicans who are negotiating, even if they sign off on it, or actually would ever vote for it. So um, on some level, this is just like filler. And maybe that filler makes some sense insofar as, you know, uh, Joe Biden's out of town, but... um, Hopefully, and Chuck Schumer has said this, that the reconciliation track is still going forward, which means that in the Senate committees, um, they are hammering out how they would expend. And we don't know what the final number would be, but presumably it should be the two point three trillion that uh, Biden presented initially, because if it's just going to be Democrats, the only person you're going to have to um massage as it were joe manchin um uh, maybe mark kelly mark warner and uh maybe uh kirsten cinema and uh so hopefully we have these committees are working on how they would spend their various silos of dollars um but we will get a better sense of that probably next week this week we're just going to hear stories about how you know these uh 10 senators are coming uh, close to an, uh, an agreement. Here is Susan Collins. Uh, she is on, uh, what was the show this weekend? Face the Nation. Face the Nation, I think it was. And um, here is uh, just, I, I, I don't even know what to call this. Um, a fascinating admission as to who pays her bills or <laughs> um, just uh, sort of just one of the most bizarre reasonings that um, I'm surprised this guy Dickerson, who, who, who's hosting, doesn't fall out of his chair when he hears this. And what about the sticky question of how to pay for all of this? Uh, what, where does it, I've heard there's reports that it might include a gas tax increase. There won't be a, de- a gas tax increase and we won't be undoing the 2017 uh, tax reform bill. I, let me talk about three of the pay fors. One is the implementation of an infrastructure financing authority. That's very similar to the state revolving funds that we use for sewer and water projects. And it's a bipartisan proposal that was first put forth by Senators Mark Warner and Roy Blunt. A second would be to repurpose some of the COVID funding that has not been spent. Uh, in the $1.9 trillion package that was enacted in March. There were restrictions on what the funding could be used for. It could be used for water, sewer, and broadband. We would make it more flexible so it could be used for infrastructure projects. And third, there would be a provision for electric vehicles to pay their fair share of using our roads and bridges. Right now, they are literally free riders because they're not paying any gas tax. So those are three of the provisions that we've taken a look at. She sounds like she's been struck by lightning. Um, well, I, I mean, I, 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 what, what, what surprised me is that uh, Dickerson does, is not struck by lightning at that point because I just want to make it clear what she's suggesting here. Um, we would absolutely not tax gas, gas being um, a fossil fuel which is maybe she is not aware of in Maine, 
although uh, some of their growing zones have literally changed over the past 20 years. Uh, they've gotten warmer. I mean, like they can't produce the same amount of maple syrup because of, of cl- something called climate change, which right. you may be familiar with. So we would not raise the gas tax. We would raise an electric car tax, <clears throat> which incidentally, uh, electric cars is one of the ways that we would fight climate change. Yeah. I'm talking not to you remedially like this because you know this, but I am talking to whoever needs to hear this so that one of our senators can find out. But I mean, part of this, though, is just what it, what does this process even mean? I mean, like, why are we even having her on Sunday talk shows to talk about the pay fors and what makes up the content of this fan- fantasy bill? I mean, there's this is a process that is going to evaporate within two or three weeks. There's going to be nothing that comes of it. It's only just a way for the Collinses and the Murkowskis and the Romneys and the cinemas to get their faces out there and perform bipartisanship when this is not going to go anywhere since we already know that Biden has ended negotiations with the Republicans. End of story. Well, and, and, and it's, it's almost worse than that, too, because on some level, it really obscures what the dynamic is in Washington. And so it's not necessarily helpful uh, as a political matter for for Democrats, uh, broadly speaking. Um, It is not terribly helpful for the public uh, to get this misunderstanding of what is going on. And uh, so it is um, it is the worst of all possible worlds. It's theater to uphold this mythology of bipartisanship that upholds senators like her. Yes, it's it's absurd, and um, you know, it's a self-licking ice cream cone is yeah, amazing on some level. And but it'll be interesting to see, like you know, wait. So so what happens? We bring up this bill, and the the Republicans shoot it down, and then we go into reconciliation. I mean, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Clint Smith, staff writer at the Atlantic, author of How the Word Is Passed: A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. We'll be right back after this. Folks, uh, today's show is sponsored in part by Liquid IV. Oh, my favorite. I just ran out of the acai. Oh, that's, uh, well. I saw we may have an extra package there. I was going to. You can take the acai. Uh, I am uh, I am now uh, either um, uh, the matcha or the uh, tangerine immune support. And we know. pear, pear. They have pear. What about pina colada, huh? And pina colada. Yeah. Uh, when you push your body hard or you just feel run down, it's important to take care of yourself. I think you know that, Emma. Uh, you got to do so with proper vitamins and nutrients. How do you do so? How do you get your body to absorb that stuff? Liquid IV. They created Hydration Multiplier Plus Immune Support to maintain and strengthen your immune system. Hydration Multiplier Plus Immune Support is a cutting edge blend of vitamin C, zinc, and Wellmune in a convenient single serving package to help strengthen your immune system. This is the one that I have been a regular of uh, recently. Tangerine, I go through cycles. Tangerine, zinc supports your immune cell health and function. Wellmune is a naturally sourced beta glucan uh, that's proven to help strengthen your immune system. Each packet, has like i say that natural tangerine flavor it tastes so good and it does uh liquid iv can provide two to three times more hydration than water alone the blend is bow- uh, powered by cellular transport technology designed to enhance rapid absorption of water and other nutrients plus side bonus the company has donated over four million servings in response to covid 19. products are being donated to hospitals they're being res- uh, donated to first responders food banks more uh folks Back when I used to travel, and hopefully again soon, I would always take uh, half a dozen packets in my bag so I don't get any jet lag, or sometimes I get dehydrated when I take a plane. And occasionally, when I have a, uh, a day where I've overindulged, or an evening where I've overindulged, um, if I'm smart, I take on one at Saturday. night. Saturday, yeah. Uh, and then I, <laughs> I'll have one in the morning, and it is uh, extremely helpful in that it regard. Is. And when I feel like I'm getting a little sick or run down, and then, of course, on a daily basis, um, I substitute the uh, matcha for coffee. 
And so um, I get that energy boost. Nice. Yep. I like it. I'm very happy with it, actually. It's my new regimen. It's important to have those type of things. Folks, uh, get your liquid IV hydration multiplier plus immune support in bulk at Costco or order online. Get 25% off. When you go to liquidiv.com, use the code majority rep at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you get better hydration today using promo code majority rep at liquidiv.com. Um, many times I have told you the best time to uh, look for new employees when you don't need one. And uh, that's um, ZipRecruiter makes it so easy. If you're a business owner who's hiring, you probably face a lot of challenges when it comes to finding the right person for your role. Believe me, I know it. That's why hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Well, you can post your job to some uh, job board, but then all you can do is hope that the right person bumps into it. That's why you should try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over the 100 top job sites. One click. One click. And ZipRecruiter's matching technology finds people with the right skills, right experience, specifically for your job, and then actively invites them to reply, uh, apply. Correct, Brendan? That's what happened to Brendan. That's how we got Brendan <laughs> here. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. We got a bunch of very quality uh, uh, people. Just Brendan was just, was literally like genetically designed to do that job. With all due respect, Brendan, I know you have another life besides here. But, uh, <laughs> and it's no wonder over 2.3 uh, million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. So listen, while other companies overwhelm you with way too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you what you're looking for, the needle in the haystack. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Once again, remember to go to this unique place, ZipRecruiter.com slash M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y, majority. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And lastly, um, we all shop online. We've done it a lot, over, obviously, over covid a lot of people we're going to continue to do it i did it beforehand too i've told you the many stories about how i, I sat my daughter down when she was of age and had the talk which was you never not search for a coupon code yes because when you're buying something online and then i um i had to give her another talk which is i uh, here is an applet it's like something you put an extension you put into your browser and it's called honey and thanks to Honey, you no longer have to manually search for coupon codes. That is a thing of the past. Very nice. Yes. The look on my daughter's face when I told her that. She was very excited. <laughs> uh, Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes. And it applies the best one uh, and inserts it into your cart. It supports over 30,000 stores uh, online, ranging from sites that have tech and gaming products to fashion brands, food delivery even, apparently. I've not... I've not I'm not, I don't do food delivery online. I'm afraid of doing that because I just, I don't know why. But huh. imagine you're shopping at one of your favorite sites. This is what happens. Uh, when you go to checkout, the honey button drops down on the right-hand side of your uh, upper right-hand side. I know. I have it in my browser. It says, uh, it says all you got to do, you click apply a coupons. You wait a few seconds. Honey searches the coupons it can find for that site. And if it finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. It has found over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. I saved five bucks on a pair of shorts the other day. But here's the part that is gonna, people are going to seem like uh, it's going to seem weird to people. Mm -hmm. I also saved like, a, I don't know, a buck or two on some cables that I bought for, uh, for the office. But I mean, uh, you know, I, I recently bought a couch. And here's the part that, that, that I like about it. And this is going to seem weird. It will tell you that there are no coupons. FOMO. That's what I'm, that's my biggest concern. Did I just buy something and lose out on a five or 10% coupon? Right. Well, with honey, one of the things that I like about it is that it actually tells me, no, Sam, you have not missed out. So you can enjoy your product without feeling like you blew it because mm -hmm. you can't go backwards. So if you don't already have honey, it's like a coupon be, in and of itself. It, that's what I'm saying. Peace of mind. What can, that's priceless. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know it's a weird thing to like about it. Right? I, honestly, it's like You'd it's almost. Have a piece of I mean, I like to get in the coupon. Of course, I like to get in the coupon. I like to save five bucks, but I also like to know that I'm not missing up an opportunity to save five bucks. <laughs> if you don't already have uh, Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you're doing yourself a solid. You're also supporting this podcast. I would uh, never recommend something I don't use. I think you know that, folks. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash majority. That's joinhoney.com slash majority. And once again, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. And when you, um, uh, when you do, you, uh, you support the free show and you get the uh, free show free of commercials. All right. I uh, want to welcome to the program staff writer at the atlantic author of the new narrative nonfiction book how the word is passed a reckoning with history uh with the history of slavery across america clint smith uh welcome to the program do we have him oh there he is uh hey there. clint welcome to the program we have uh, uh emma vigland here as well how are you all doing uh, well thanks for being here clint uh yeah. thank you thanks for joining us you know you're um you, uh, to a certain extent I mean, this may be completely far out of field, but uh, there was a quality of of your book that, um, and and it was it's far more deliberate. But it reminded me of uh, this movie, this documentary from like 30 years ago called Sherman's March uh, mm -hmm. by Ross McElwee, a, 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 a documentary filmmaker up at Harvard who, who went off to do Sherman's March and then ended up just talking about the world in general. And I think on some level, what's interesting about your book to me is it is both an exploration of 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 history and the massive absence of 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 this history um you went to uh, uh eight different sites i think you went to more uh but you ended up writing about eight just what was the what was the idea behind why, why did you decide to 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 write this book and and in particularly like the way you did um uh, write it yeah so this book began in May 2017 when I was watching the statues of uh, several Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans. So I was watching statues of Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, PGT Beauregard, all leaders in the Confederacy be taken down. And I was wondering what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And what does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard. To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Highway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy. That to this day, my parents live on a street named after somebody who owned 150 enslaved people. Because the thing about monuments and memorials and iconography is that, and symbols is that they're not just symbols. They are reflective of the stories that societies tell and those stories embed themselves into the narratives communities carry and those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives which isn't to say that taking down a 60 foot tall statue of robert e lee is going to erase the racial wealth gap but it is to say that it is part of uh it is one part of a larger ecosystem of stories and ideas that shape how we understand what has happened to certain communities and what needs to be accounted for uh, and what needs to be amended uh, to repair the harm that has been done to different communities across generations. And so I started getting obsessed with how slavery was remembered or misremembered in New Orleans and then sort of expanded it out to think about how it was remembered or misremembered across the country and ultimately wanted to go to different places that represented the, the sort of patchwork of memory and the patchwork of experiences that uh, are reflective of how of the inconsistent way that this country memorializes slavery i i i have become um i mean we're, we're sort of in a period it's it seems to me of a um like a corrective period about that history just seemingly um being more more present and maybe we can talk about maybe why that is we're going through this period and 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 certainly i feel like um in my in my education, you know, like it just seems like I, I learned nothing. You know, I wasn't necessarily a bad student. I wasn't necessarily a good student, but it just seemed, seemed to be uh, available at the time. But I wonder, like on that that primary question, like do, as you grew up in that context, in the shadow of all these uh, homages to to enslavers, like what what was the, the was there consciousness of that? I mean, you individually or just like with your friends? I mean, did it occur, occur to anybody to say like, hey, wait a second, what? That's, 
really messed up. Like, I'm just trying to think like if I walked down the street and it was like, you know, I'm just going down Goebbels Avenue. And uh, one day it occurs to me, like, wait a second. Uh, there's a, you know, I, I have some history with that guy a little bit. I mean, what, but I, was there a level of consciousness about that or? I think part of the insidiousness of the success of the Lost Cause project um, it's, and the success of a uh, uh, history of white supremacy attempting to distort and manipulate history more generally is that I didn't really have any any consciousness of what those statues were, what they represented. You know, I, I think all the time about how uh, the statue of PUGT Beauregard sits in the, you know, in front of City Park, uh, where I would go and like feed the ducks and the geese with my mom on the weekends, and that I was literally, you know, feeding the ducks under the statue of a man who ordered the first attack that opened the Civil War. But I had no conception of who that person was. He was part of, uh, he felt like he was just part of what ornamented the entire city, which are these statues of white men on pedestals. Um, and so it wasn't until my adulthood that I feel like I gained a more acute understanding of who these people were and what they stood for. And part of the thing is that part of what white supremacy attempts to do is take empirical statements and turn them into ideological ones, right? So if I say the Confederacy was a treasonous territory that that seceded from the union and raised an army predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery from in a lot of circles that would be perceived as an ideological statement. And if I'm in a classroom, that would be perceived as me attempting to indoctrinate students with my political beliefs when it's actually just reflective of the empirical and historical evidence that we have, right? Like the, the Confederacy said it for themselves. They, if you look at the declarations of Confederate secession in 1861, they, they say it. a state like Mississippi says, quote, our position is thoroughly aligned with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interests of the world, All right? So they were not vague about why they were seceding from the union. They were quite clear about it. But part of what has happened over the course of a, more than a century now is that those stories uh, and that sort of evidence, that sort of primary source evidence is not presented to students. And so the narrative of the Confederacy being this thing that was just fighting for states' rights or Robert E. Lee being an honorable man who was just doing right by his community or that this war was a war of Northern aggression rather than uh, one that was predicated on these folks leaving the country in order to sustain this uh, abominable social and economic practice, um, it gets muddled, right? It becomes a sort of Orwellian thing where it's not even meant to make turn everybody into racist. It's just meant to make people confused to the point where in 2018, you have a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center that shows that only 8% of US high school seniors are able to identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War, because we, we our teaching around it has been so people are either scared to address it at all, right, for fear that something will happen. And I think we see in state legislatures across the country, uh, an intentional effort to to amplify and magnify that chilling effect to make teachers scared to even touch this stuff so that you have continue to have young people growing up with a skewed sense of what the Confederacy was, what slavery was, and, and thus how it has shaped the social, economic, and political landscape of, of our country today. Well, and, part and of this too, I, I would say, is like it goes deeper than just, I think, the Civil War as well, right? I mean, there's this this concept of Thomas Jefferson, you write about the, the with Monticello, about how there's a quote uh, from someone who took the tour that says this really took the shine off of our guy because it's about this greater American mythology mm -hmm. that upholds then secondarily the conversation that we're talking about the Civil War, right? I mean, can you just talk about the deeper roots of how we, we fetishize, mythologize, whatever you want to say, our founding fathers, it is rooted in American exceptionalism and white supremacy. And then of course it's at its starkest in the way that we learn about the Civil War. Yeah, absolutely. So the first chapter of the book is about Monticello. And, and I wanted to go to Monticello specifically because Jefferson is such a fascinating historical character to me in the sense that I think he personifies so many of the complexities and contradictions and the sort of cognitive dissonance of this country's history, which is to say that this America is a place that has provided unparalleled, unimaginable opportunities for millions of people across generations to achieve uh, wealth accumulation and upward mobility in ways that their ancestors could have never imagined. And it has done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people who've been intergener intergenerationally subjugated and oppressed to create that wealth and opportunity for the other group. 
And so both of those things are the story of America. And you have to hold the sort of duality uh, of both of those things in order to understand the duality of this country. And Jefferson similarly, I think, again, embodies that where he is someone who wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world, and also enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children that he had by an enslaved woman, Sally Hemings. He wrote in one document that all men are created equal and wrote in another document that black people are inferior to whites, quote, in both endowments of body and mind. And so when I go to a place like Monticello, part of what I'm trying to understand is how does an institution that is in many ways dedicated to preserving the memory and legacy of this person preserve an honest legacy of all of who he was. And not only in, in, in preserving that space, Monticello, recognizing that Monticello didn't just belong to Jefferson, but also the hundreds of enslaved people who lived there across generations, who in many ways, that land belonged to even more so than it does to Jefferson, because Jefferson was in Paris, in DC, in Philadelphia, in New York for significant stretches of time. And it was these enslaved families, the Hemingses, the Fawcett's, the Grangers, who who cultivated that land, who built memories on that land, who created community on that land. Um, and so in order to understand, again, to your point, like why our country looks the way that it does today, we have to understand the, the nature of how the people who created the social contract upon which this country was founded, who they wanted to include in the, that, as the beneficiaries of that social contract and who they imagined being the people who were going to be exploited to make those benefits possible for others. And, and, and speaking of that exploitation, what is also, I think, sort of fascinating about that is that, you know, he as a farmer has will, would have no time to do that. We're not for like uh, for, you know, like I, I I never hear it anymore. But 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 as a kid, I remember, you know, there was like this, like behind every uh, great man is a, you know, is a is, is a great woman or a strong woman or something like that. And but um, I reject that cheesy well, statement. I, I, but but the interesting thing is, is like, you know, behind every guy who had the time to draft a constitution for is, you know, 500 slaves, essentially, who were financing uh, this guy's being able to have all this time to think. Um, and that it, 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 it was was really striking, like that concept. And 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 that is not it in any way communicated, I think. Well, I mean. So let's also talk about that, the, the, the concept of you, like um, you, you could have just written about these places without sort of um, assessing how people who are learning these things for the first time and, and, or, or, you know, were absorbing them. I mean, talk about that dynamic where you're, you're interviewing people as, they, they, the, as the shine comes off of, uh, of Jefferson a little bit. Yeah, so... Two of the people that I interviewed were uh, women named Donna and Grace. And and so Monticello is interesting because I think it represents a place that evolves in the way that is told, has evolved in the way that it is told the story of that place and of Jefferson. So, you know, you talk to people who went there 30, 20, 10 years ago, their experience at Monticello is very different from what I experienced when I went there in 2018, um, where now they have a, a tour dedicated to the Hemings family. They have a tour specifically about the history of slavery at Monticello. Uh, but some critique of it is that all of these tours are, are separate tours, right? And that there's the primary house tour um, in which somebody, uh, you know, I went on the house tour and I went on the slavery at Monticello tour. And on the house tour, there wasn't really a lot of discussion about Jefferson as an enslaver. It might have been mentioned. But to your point that I think is really important is that like nothing, you know, Jefferson is a was a very smart person and and had a range of interests, philosophical, scientific, um, geographic. I mean, he, you know, his mind was sort of everywhere, but he only had the time to pursue those interests, uh, to write these letters, to explore these ideas because of the labor of, of hundreds of enslaved people who did that. And so I was on, I was on the slavery at Monticello tour and Donna and Grace were clearly being uh, unsettled by what so much of what they were hearing from our guide, a guy named David Thorson. And David, you know, I, as I mentioned in the book, in the span of 45 minutes to an hour, was more direct and honest about Jefferson and the, his relationship to slavery in ways that I had, I was like, why didn't I learn this in eighth grade social studies class? Like this should have been central to, to my understanding of this. But they were, 
Um, but I was familiar with the information and these women from what I could tell on their faces clearly weren't. So I went up to them after and was talking to them and they were just like, I had no idea that Jefferson was a slave owner. I had no idea that Monticello was a plantation. And mind you, these are folks who like bought plane tickets, rented a car, got a hotel room and like came to this place as a sort of pilgrimage to, uh, to honor and to find, to, to see the home of the, one of our founding fathers and the third president of the United States, and who had no idea that he enslaved human beings. And I, th I think that that is a sort of microcosm of the failure of how slavery is taught across this country, um, in which you could have people who came to this place to pay tribute to this man, and who had no idea what this place actually was and who this man and what this man did to people on this land. Um, and, and I think it was an important reminder for me because I think in the worlds that I move in, um, every, everybody's like, oh, Jefferson, Jefferson was an enslaver. Like he's, you know, he was a, he's a hypocrite. He was more, full of moral contradictions. Like that is how we understand who Jefferson was. But there are a lot of people who just don't know um, a lot of information and not just about Jefferson, but about slavery writ large. Um, and, and that is again, in, 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 is it intentional? It is intentional. It is the result of an F, uh, mid 19th century effort uh, during after the Civil War to prevent the to prevent us from having a collective understanding of what slavery was. And most people don't realize that it wasn't until the mid 20th century during the Civil Rights Movement that the narrative around slavery began to shift. Like it wasn't until the work of historians like Kenneth Stamp and others and, and that his work gained mainstream popularity because of the work of activists and uh, civil rights leaders, that the understanding of slavery began to shift toward like, oh, this was a horrific, cruel, abominable institution. Because until the mid 20th century, the popular narrative around it collectively in this country was that it was a civilizing institution. Ulrich B. Phillips, the predominant historian who, who propagated this idea, talked about plantations as these places that uh, civilized Africans from the savage year of Africa. Uh, that uh, as the late Senator John Calhoun from South Carolina, you know, he would always talk about slavery as a, as a positive good for both black and white alike. And that narrative was, was central to America's collective understanding of slavery for a century before it began to shift. And we're still attempting to sort of unwind uh, so much of that. Uh, yeah, I, that, that dynamic I just find uh, fascinating. And I guess, I mean, it's sort of obvious on some level, like why it was um why so many participated in that that sort of um i guess mystification of of our history because um it it served their power interests right i mean uh, and 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 it sort of kicked off uh, you know during reconstruction with a lot of like literal massacres uh, to make sure that um that they were in, in charge of those things let's let's talk about um y the next place you write about and and I and I wonder, like you know, you, you go from uh, uh, Monticello to to the Whitney Plantation, then to the Angola prison, uh, a, a cemetery, a Blanford Cemetery that is um, uh, of uh, Confederate um, uh, soldiers, then to Galveston Island, uh, for, you know, where uh, sort of the birthplace of, of Juneteenth, uh, up to New York City, and then to uh, Senegal at Gory Island. Um, what what was it? How did you want to order this? Um, like, was there a specific? I mean, you obviously went to a bunch of different places, but was there a specific? When you were contemplating uh, the the ordering of these things, what what was behind that? It's a great question. Um, so the it's not necessarily placed in chronological order, right? Um, you know, and part of what I wanted to do was tell what felt almost like a, it's not completely like this, but to some extent, like an intergenerational story of slavery and the different ways that it would manifest itself, right? So, so Galveston and Juneteenth comes directly after Blanford, which is a place that is focused predominantly on and thinking about the Civil War and the legacy of the Civil War. And then I go before I go, so let me go back. So I begin with the two plantations, Monticello and the Whitney Plantation, and think about how those places that were central sites of enslavement in the South, uh, reckoning with that history. And then go to Angola, which is a place that, you know, I could have put Angola after um, 
the maybe after Juneteenth to talk about the way that convict leasing uh, shaped, you know, the and created the sort of afterlife of slavery, as the scholar Cydia Hartman talks about. Uh, but what I wanted to do in that instance was put Angola in conversation with the Whitney, given that they're both in Louisiana, given that they're only an hour apart from one another, um, given that the guy I go to Angola with, Norris Henderson, who was incarcerated at Angola for 30 years, talks about how when he goes to the Whitney, he is able to more effectively make sense of his experience at Angola. Um, and so part of it is like trying to tell somewhat of a linear intergenerational story, but also not at the expense of being able to put things in conversation with one another um, that I think uh, stand well together or are helpful for the reader um, and helpful for me in making sense of these things when when they're side by side. Um, oh, so, um, so tell us about Angola, because this is um, also like one of those things where I think is in somewhat analogous to the idea of like, you know, walking down, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, walking down the Klaus Barbie Boulevard or something mm -hmm. uh, on some level and then going, hey, wait a second. What? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, tell us about Angola prison. This is a massive, massive uh, prison in Louisiana. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think about that all the time with Angola. So Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the country. It is 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It is a place where 75% of the people held there are black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences. Uh, and it is built on top of a former plantation. And what I tell people is that if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would rightfully be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It would be abhorrent. It would be disgusting. We would never allow a place like that to exist because it would so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country where the vast majority of people held there are Black men serving life sentences, working for virtually no pay on land that was once a plantation, picking crops while someone watches over them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. And so part of what I'm exploring when I go to Angola is, is what are the ways that a history of white supremacy not only enacts physical violence against people's bodies, but also collectively numbs us to certain types of violences that in, in another global context would be wildly unacceptable. And what does it mean that that place not only is not addressing and confronting and being honest about its relationship to that history, um, but that that place has a gift shop in front of it. And at, at the gift shop in front of the prison is uh, our pair of our shot glasses and uh, baseball caps and stuffed animals and sweatshirts and coffee mugs. And on one of the coffee mugs, there's a, there's a silhouette of a watchtower and above and below there's, there's text written and it says Angola, a gated community. And so not only is it not addressing its relationship to this history, but it's, it's making a mockery of or, and belittling and, and making fun of the experiences of thousands of people who are still held there today, many of whom were sentenced to serve life in prison there when they were children, many of whom were sentenced by non-unanimous juries, which has since been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, right? And so, you know, I could have written a whole book about well, they literally have a rodeo. I mean, they, they have, a rodeo. have a like to talk about making a mockery of it. They have uh, you can maybe expand on this, but they have a show where people buy tickets and they watch the people who are imprisoned, is my understanding, perform in this rodeo for like a chance at some small payout. Yeah, yeah. So I've not experienced the rodeo uh, personally. Um, I've seen a lot of footage of it and read a lot about it, but. Um, it is, it's interesting because some people attempt to take the rodeo and they'll be like, oh, well, like the people who are participating in the rodeo, like they choose to do it. Like they, it's their decision. They're not being forced to do it. But the thing that you have to understand about prison um, is that you have so little agency and the nature of your days is full of so much monotony that you look for anything to to break up the monotony of your time to and to give you a sense of something to look forward to even when the thing to look forward to is dangerous and might result in you getting run over by a bull 
and like having, I mean, there are stories of people who've broken legs, broken arms, broken their necks. Um, but if you, it's, it's like if you were in a desert and somebody shows up in the desert and they have like a cup of dirty water and they're like, do you want this dirty water? You're going to be like, yeah, I want that dirty water. And it's not, and, and that person, it would be wrong then for somebody to be like, well, you love dirty water. You decided to drink that dirty water. So like, you just, you must like doing it. It's it, when you have limited options of ways with which to make meaning of your life or to do anything other than sit inside your cell, people grab hold of those, even when it is as cruel and insidious as it is. And so I think any sort of idea of like per, a person making a decision to do something has to be understood in the context from which that decision is emerging. I, I have to say that, like, you know, if I, if I, it, 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 the, the, the idea that uh, Angola is built on a plantation, it's almost like if it almost seems manufactured, like I, I want to do a movie and I want to, um, you know, create this metaphor of, you know, sort of like what, of, the legacy of, of slavery and just how it mutates into, um, you know, the way that we can still maintain this type of social control and uh, create an underclass. I have an idea. Let's situate a prison on top of a plantation. Like, I mean, that's it almost seems like um, like like, like uh, almost like fictional, like a fictional choice. Mm -hmm. um, talk about Blanford Cemetery. Um, that was not originally where you were intending to go. It was not. Um, and part of what I had really enjoyed about the book. I think any nonfiction writer, you know, the process is like you write a proposal and you tell the publisher, like, this is what I'm going to write about. This is the people I'm going to talk to. These are the things I'm going to do. And then, you know, a year, two years, three years later, you you look at your book and you're like, this is very different than <laughs> what my proposal said. Uh, and especially with a book like this, where like, I, I literally, even in the places that I went, like I wanted to go to Monticello and I wrote about Monticello, even at a place like Monticello, so much of how I write about that place depends on the people I meet at that time, at that on that day, um, in that place, right? So, so it is. None of these are sort of definitive accounts of any of these places. They are reflections of my experience at an, at each of these places at any given point in time. Uh, but the Blanford, you know, I initially thought I was going to write a chapter on uh, Civil War battlefields, and I, so I went to this uh, Civil War battlefield. Uh, that's a national park in petersburg virginia and and i wanted the tour and i was like okay this is interesting i think there's something here but i was telling the tour guide uh the ranger about my project and he was like oh you should go to uh this confederate cemetery it's about 10 minutes down the road and i was like confederate cemetery i mean it's it's something that i would have never there's like things you would do on your own and then things you do as a journalist like in my own capacity i'd be like there's no chance that i'm ever gonna go to a confederate cemetery but so you know my the the journalist in me started you know uh being like oh okay i think that that's that sounds like a fascinating thing that i had that, that like truly wasn't it was never even on my mind uh as a potential possibility and so i went and i think you know i went on this tour in which they gave this tour of of the church and and for context blanford is one of the largest confederate cemeteries in the country a place where the remains of thirty thousand confederate soldiers are buried and and i went on a tour of the church at the center of the cemetery and they were pointing to all these stained glass windows and talking in intimate detail about their history and then the tour ended and i was like well, this is this is bizarre that we just spent all this time talking about the beauty of these stained glass windows with with saints you know in embedded in them and we're not talking at all about why these windows were built like who they were built in honor of or the land that we're standing on and literally that at the bottom of the windows it says in honor of our brave Confederate soldiers who fought for a just cause and different iterations of that. And so then I came back, uh, there was a flyer inside of the visitor center. I was talking to the, to a woman who works inside the visitor center and there was a flyer on the, on the desk in front of her. And we were talking, my eyes started kind of wandering and I looked down and I was like, what is that? And then she like thrust her hand on top of it. And I was like, oh, this is this is strange. And and I sort of could read between her fingers that it was a flyer promoting uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration happening there a few weeks from then. And so I was like, well, I have to come back for this. And so I, I came back for the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration. Um, and 
uh, I was I was conspicuous, as you can imagine, uh, a conspicuous presence. I went with my white friend, William. My wife wouldn't let me go by myself. She was like, you got to take you got to take your white friend. And so I was like, Billy, come on, man, we got to go to we got to go to the Confederate cemetery. Um, and so we went and and it was just so clarifying uh, because I was spending the day with these sons, Confederate veterans, these United Daughters of the Confederacy, these um confederate reenactors neo-confederates um kind of the whole spectrum and and having conversations with them about why they believed what they believed you know that slavery wasn't a central cause of the civil war that it was overblown it was the war of northern aggression that the you know all the people buried in this uh confederate cemetery were people worthy of being honored that uh you know and the keynote speaker was paul c grambling who was at that time the commander-in-chief as they call it, of the Sons Confederate Veterans. And when he was giving a speech, he said that all the people who wanted to take down the statues of Confederate uh, leaders were, were the American ISIS. He's like, they're terrorists, and they're trying to erase history in the same way that ISIS is in the Middle East, uh, and we should treat them as such. Um, and so it was just, again, clarifying to understand how the lost cause manifests itself today. Because I think for some people, you can, you know, their understanding of history is not grounded in empirical evidence or primary source documents. It is a story they have been told. And it is a story they tell. It is an heirloom that is passed down across generations. Um, and who they understand them to be in the world is very much shaped by uh, the stories they've been told by people they love, even when those stories are, are, are false. So is that is that relationship that they have to the story is it is it a relationship that exists to their uh to the people who told them it or is it is, is you know like how much of that story is also important like they could have been told any story right and yeah. oh you're you're telling me something contrary to that that has implications to like my relationship with my my grandfather who passed away like because he's the one who told me that story and if that story's not real what else don't i know about him and and everything i thought about him was wrong and it that implicates that relationship as opposed to the part of it where it's like oh the reality you're telling me implicates my relationship to just like everything around me and who i am in the world you know distinct from my finding out that my grand my grandfather was sort of a fraud or whatever mm -hmm. it's like how much of what do you think that balance is there? I think it's it's absolutely both. Um, I mean, I think about a conversation I had with a guy named Jeff who uh, told me about how when he was a kid, he would his grandfather would take him to the cemetery and they would sit in the gazebo uh, at the center of the cemetery and and watch at dusk as the sun would set and the deers would sort of slalom through the tombstones and he would sing him songs that his grandfather had sang him and he would tell him about all the people who were buried here, who were part of his community, part of his family, and how they, they're they so misunderstood by this country and how they fought a war to protect their families and their loved ones and that you know they weren't racist and slavery had nothing to do with it. And um, that's propaganda. And that's and so these are the stories that Jeff grows up with. And, and Jeff now has his own granddaughters who he brings to the cemetery and tells the same story to. And so it very much is deeply entangled in a sort of emotional and psychological and intimate relationship that people have with the people they love who told them these stories. And we see this manifest itself not only in the lost call, we see this in religion, we see this in politics, we see this in all, uh, there are all sorts of ways that the heirloom of ideology is passed down and people either grapple with it and reject it or create nuance within it or create distinct, like granddad is uh, homophobic and racist and like you know and you put that here and then you like still go to thanksgiving dinner and you just try to keep it or you know whatever the case may be um but for a lot of people there's if if they are if they accept that so many of the stories that they that they're the people who love them told them about who they were who this country is who their community is it it becomes difficult to disentangle their love for that person from the things that that person told them. And I think embedded within that is your second point of then it brings in, it becomes this existential question or this existential crisis where so much of how someone has come to understand themselves in the world 
has been shaped by the stories that they have been told by these people who were telling lies. And so if they're going to accept that these were lies, then it it shatters so much of how they have situated themselves in relationship to history, in relationship to this country, in relationship to the world. And and that is a hard thing for many people to to let go of. You know, one of the guys at the end of the book that I talk about um, said, you want to you want me to accept that my great great grandfather was a monster. And for me, I'm like, I actually am not interested in the interiority of your grandfather's heart or spirit. You know, like that's that's kind of secondary to me. Um, it is important that you accept that your grandfather, your great grandfather fought for a monstrous cause. Right. Like there's a difference between like whether someone is a monster and and the actions that they did. I mean, it's kind of the way that our understanding um, rightfully of, of how racism manifests itself is moving away from an interpersonal understanding of of its manifestations to a systemic a structural one one that's grounded in policy and and action um so so yeah it's it's if so much of who you believe yourself to be in the world is animated by things you realize are lies then you just tell yourself that they're not lies and you say that everybody else is lying i i almost feel like when when you were saying that that like we need to put an asterisk on this so that we do not um uh fall foul of the uh, critical race theories um uh <laughs> that we have to, to um i mean to a certain extent like that's what that whole critical race theory i don't know a uh, boogie man or person that is being unleashed it feels like on some level is a reaction on to to I mean, I don't know. I don't think I'm imagining that there has been a sort of revisiting of the implications of slavery over the past like 10, 10 years or so. I mean, just in terms of like, you know, we do five interviews a week or four interviews a week. And just like the, the books that are coming out about, you know, the relationship of, of the co- of cotton to the entire country's economy. There was, you know, uh, and, and there has been more sort of uh, of, of uh, you know, in, in Reconstruction um, and uh, and Juneteenth, it sort of feels like it's making a little bit of a, Tulsa a, a comeback. Race well, master, Tulsa, yeah. and Tulsa and Charleston and all the other ones that yeah. we um but do you, I mean, what do you think accounts for this? I mean, like what's happening generationally that there is space for this now? Is it just like that certain generations have died off and there's space or that there's, what else do you think is happening? I mean, I think, I, I think it is mostly attributed to the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, I think in the same way that the civil rights movement completely recalibrated the way that people understood the origins of black, white inequality, um, and lifted up an entire new generation of social historians who who used history um, to make sense of the the present, to make sense of why what we were seeing with Jim Crow, to make sense of what we were seeing with segregation, to make sense of what we were seeing with white supremacist violence, and that gave people a new understanding of the history from which it emerged. I think now, since you know 2012, 2013. Um, part of what activists and organizers have done is open up space for writers and academics and journalists and artists to go back into that history to help us understand that what happened to Mike Brown, what happened to Renisha McBride, what happened to Eric Garner, what happened to, you know, the list goes on and on with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, is not, they're not isolated incidents, but the, the context that shaped what those police departments look like, the historical context that shaped what the communities look like in which those police are operating, the context that has shaped what sort of resources communities do or don't have socially and economically, that that is all part of a history that that we tell ourselves was a long time ago, but it in fact wasn't that long ago at all. And, And part of what I want the reader to understand in this book is that we both have a, a physical proximity to this landscape that is profound in which the scars of this history are, are all around us. You know, I wrote this book about nine places. I could have written about 10,000 and nine, you know, it's, it's everywhere, but not only our physical proximity, but our temporal proximity, right? That, that this institution existed for 250 years and has only not existed for 150. So it existed for a hundred years longer than, than it didn't. And, and again, there, there are people who, are still with us who had relationships 
to those who were born into bondage. The woman who opened the museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016, alongside the Obama family, was the daughter of an enslaved person. Like not the granddaughter or the great granddaughter. She was the daughter of someone who was born into slavery. And this is in 2016. My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved, right? So when I imagine my grand, my son, my four-year-old son sitting on my grandfather's lap, I think about my grandfather and imagine him sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm reminded that, again, this history we tell ourselves was a long time ago, wasn't that long ago at all. And so the idea that that history, which wasn't that long ago, would have nothing to do with what our contemporary landscape of inequality looks like is morally and intellectually disingenuous. It has everything to do with it. All of our political, economic, and social infrastructure has been shaped by this thing that was only a few generations ago. And not to mention, I think one of the things your book shows too is that the elements of that institution still exist. Like the the ideological framework and the understanding of the world uh, is still being taught on some level. And so uh, the the actual dynamic of, of the institution doesn't exist, but sort of like the the, the vapors of it is still sort of floating around in the air in some fashion. Yeah, and, and sort of uh, like so the scholar Sadia Hartman talks about it as the afterlife of slavery, right? In which, you know, if we think about prison, for example, I'm not someone who would say that prison is slavery. Um, I think they are two phenomenologically different things and like should be interrogated on their own terms and their own precise terms, right? But certainly... <laughs> contemporary prisons in our contemporary carceral state carries the the remnants and the residue of that history in, in really profound ways um, and that that needs to be understood and accounted for and not just in things that are sort of self-evident like our prison system but in you know our electoral college you know our history of gerrymandering our the zoning policies we have, the, I mean, just the list goes on and on and on, but ultimately you realize that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not because singularly of the people in those communities or what they have or have not done, but it's because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. And so this book is about slavery, but that's, you know, and even if we were just to account for slavery, that would be true. But then when it kept going, then with the Black Codes, then with Jim Crow, then with segregation, not with redlining, and then, you know, mass incarceration, mass criminalization. So we see and continue to see different iterations of it. Um, and and part of what it, uh, an, a part of what a deep understanding of history does, and part of why you have so many state sanctioned efforts in legislatures across the country attempting to, to ch prevent teachers from teaching it, is because when you realize the history of this country, this country can't lie to you anymore. It can't lie to you about why certain people have things and certain people don't. And it, they, you can no longer attribute it to notions of like what people morally deserve or don't deserve because they did or didn't work hard. But you understand it as being the result of, again, like state sanctioned policies that have been enacted across generations. Clint Smith, the uh, book is How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that at uh, majority.fm. Again, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, folks, quick break. We'll be right back with more. All right, folks, that is uh, all of our show uh, for today. Uh, if you're watching us on Peacock, which, of course, uh, you can see uh, this program play at 10 p.m. Uh, on Peacock. And also you can watch uh, the uh, other interview show uh, that uh, Emma and I do. Great uh, interviews. Good, call it uh, Reported. Yeah, we do a couple of um, uh couple of interviews uh, a day uh, extra with the reporters mostly uh, getting reported stories so you can check that out uh, so if you're leaving us we will see you again tomorrow and if you're staying with us we're going to head into uh, the fun half rather quickly we're going to do uh, an abbreviated fun half today 
So I have uh, some chores to do, uh, but no, maybe I'll talk about that another time. Um, just a reminder, it's your support that makes the show uh, possible. Uh, thanks uh, so much. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. All that and more. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe yeah so tonight for uh, left reckoning patreon members so patreon.com slash left reckoning gene bajalon david griscom and i and another i think professor guest um brought by gene will be going through the 1776 project you know the trump's response to the 1619 <laughs> project um which has a lot of interesting facts about the constitution like did you know that it is important to note that by design there's room in the constitution for significant change and reform indeed great reforms and that lists some like abolition women's suffrage and then anti-communism uh -huh. the civil rights movement and the pro-life movement right. have often come forward to improve our dedication to the document oh that's wonderful that's great uh, we'll be discussing that patreon.com slash left reckoning that's for patrons only tonight like that all rolled up into one it's nice. <laughs> nice to, uh, it's like a stowaway on a train or something. Uh, all right, folks, see you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. And the alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danarchy's song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danarchy. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break for people. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, hell, hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total Uh Oh, he did switch it. I didn't listen carefully to see if that was switched. Uh, it wasn't switched, no. It was not switched. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we gotta like put in like a just a beep or something like that you know we could lay a, a, a beep over it right yeah 
All right. Yeah, that's... We'll yeah, that. Beep that echoes. People don't know what you're referring to. Beep, beep. The well, C word in the... C word in the, the, the thing word, apparently yeah. gets us... Um, <laughs> demonetized. <laughs> because big tech, man. Yeah. They're trying can... to silence us. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to silence us. We don't get to say the C word in the, the interstitial. Starts with a C, just like cancel culture. Yeah, Attack exactly. on the First Amendment. We should have the right to say the C word. <laughs> uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to do, it's just going to be, we, we, get, we get about 18 minutes. Uh, I'm sorry. It's really? Good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got about 18 minutes and, uh, you know, uh, explain this uh, tomorrow. All right. People, people will be okay about it. I think so, yeah. When they find out. Uh, Peach Keen, the 1776 project is now the 1776 pack, and they're financing pro propaganda candidates for the school board positions at a local level. How do we counter this? Um, you know, well, obviously people, you know, people got to, you know, get a run for, for, for school board. Um, but yeah, it's a real problem. It is a uh, real, it's a real problem. Um, boy, which one of these uh, clips should we do? Uh, uh let's do this. Um, the Eric Adams one is pretty nuts. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, let's do the Eric Adams one. Uh, there's a couple in here that I want to get to. But here is uh, Eric Adams, um, who, I, I don't know. I mean, does he have kids? Has he ever been to school before? Like, isn't he like a teacher? Non-New Yorkers should know. Well, he was a former cop. That's right, it's a former cop. He never, he never taught? Right. Yeah, um, and he, he, so he wants to bring what his experience is with the prison system, apparently, to New York City schools as a mayoral candidate. That's his... Uh... This is pretty stunning. Here, This is from the uh, Matt Skidmore show. By using the new technology of remote learning, you don't need children to be in a school building with a number of teachers. It's just the opposite. You could have one great teacher that's in one of our specialized high schools to teach three to 400 students who are struggling in math with the skillful way that they're able to teach. Now, I should say just uh, that uh, pot's legal in uh, in New York now. So, because um, he's high. I mean, that's a galaxy brain idea. I mean, and here's the thing that we can sort of like test this out to see if it works. Imagine if you were that there was a pandemic and you had a high school kid uh, and there was, you knew a bunch of high school kids who were actually learning this way. And they would tell you, you can't learn that way. Like that does not work in high school. It doesn't work. I mean, but how do you streamline education, make it more efficient, cost effective? And the way we'll get the boom. best teachers like this is, this is Psychotic. honestly, that's a scam. That is a, that is a scam. Like the, that is like for-profit uh, co colleges, but it's even worse than that because, you know, uh, uh, by the time you're in college, you presumably have like some foundation of how to learn. I can tell you, my daughter is getting fantastic grades and she comes to me almost every day and goes like, yeah, I am learning nothing, nothing. I mean, the number one thing when you learn about education is that one of the top indicators that a child is going to be successful or learn is that if they have m the most one-on-one -on -one attention possible, if the classroom size is smaller and that they're able to have a teacher give them personalized attention. People always seem to say that that is the way to go. Am I wrong here? And and you know what's stunning about this too, about with three or 400 kids is like, there's not just like less one-on-one -on -one attention. There's no one-on-one no well, -on -one attention. Learn your why don't you just warehouse these 14 year olds and then have a, a, a projector with the teacher just speaking down to them yes sir you know what that model is that he's describing broadcasting podcasts yeah, yeah. podcasts right like like i got news for you folks i don't brag about this but apparently i went to yale because i <laughs> listened to a 12 episode or 20 episode podcast on reconstruction i went to yale from a Yale professor. I mean, this is just so bizarre. I can't believe he's actually saying this out loud. Well, who and, is in his ear that wants to streamline education or make it more uh, technologically based? I mean, Bill Gates has crashed and burned in New York or, or, or with that project. Who's next in line that's speaking to Eric Adams whispering in his ear? I, I mean, like, honestly, like, um, 
you know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I sadly wouldn't know like which candidate to say like in the in the New York mayoral race should be broadcasting this everywhere because I want that candidate to win, but somebody should because I definitely want that candidate to lose. Well, he's the front runner. Maya and, Wiley's climbing in the polls, so there's a lot of there's a piece in the Nation today that the the best option to get rid of uh, Adams and Yang is to back Maya Wiley. So take that for what you will. Yeah, it's tough. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, but that that is the type of thing that like, you know, if I if I had if I had a, a million dollars and I wanted to make sure that that guy lost, I would be buying media right now and tell every parent in the world like this is his plan for the education, because the, the, the number of parents who would be like, uh, hell no, hell no, I would say would be a close to like a one to one yield. Yep. That's nuts. That is nuts. Um, it's a perverse view of education. It is totally perverse. Hey, speaking of perverse, let's check in on Dave Rubin's project uh, in uh, being the last liberal. Um, he now, now just to, just recap here, just so we can put this in context. Dave Rubin was a liberal. He says, uh, what, like ten years ago? Eight years ago, a seven years liberal, ago, like a box, five liberal. or six years ago. When was it? I mean, he left TYT, what, like eight years ago? Around that. Before yeah, I I'd say, you know, it probably around when he started um, being IDW five years ago was when he really started going conservative. But he would have called himself a liberal back then. Oh, he too. certainly was calling yeah. himself. He was calling himself the last liberal. Right. Um, so he was a liberal, let's say, in the teens, the 20 teens. You know what I mean? Just I just want to put that in context because now he claims he he actually was even misplaced then. Uh, and I want you to just watch a couple of things. One, you know, uh, Dave Rubin speaking, so you, you can tell that it's going to be somewhat uh, incomprehensible. Like, in, you know, two, the amount of sweat pouring off this guy. I don't know if it was because he's nervous or it was really hot in the auditorium. And uh, three, uh, just how much this crowd loves him. So it's funny, a few people have asked me uh, here, you know, Dave, well, do you, do you still call yourself a liberal? Does it make sense to call yourself a liberal? And, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a DeLorean and a flux capacitor, and I can't go back to France in 1780 where I could say I was a liberal with a straight face. I have no problem. I am actually quite proud to stand in front of you and tell you that I'm a conservative. I, I have no problem doing that whatsoever. That you can applaud. That, I, thought, I thought that was going to be a big... But, People aren't used to live performances again. You guys know I'm live, right? We're doing this, it's fully live. I'm a human, no tape delay here. We're all sitting in Zoom boxes all day long. It's crazy. You see what they've done to us? They've made us all crazy. You can see a human in front of you. Is that a real person? I can't believe it. I mean, but I, okay. To, to have the confidence every time you bomb to blame it on society like that, this is because <laughs> we're all in Zoom boxes. Right. right. It's well, the liberals making this crazy. That's why I had to Jeb Bush the audience. Exactly. That's why I had to remind you that uh, you should be excited that I'm conservative and clap for me now. But the other part that I found interesting about that is that not only is it like, it's society's fault I'm not funny, but also they. They put us in Zoom boxes. Who's the Z? Who's the they? Well, he's bringing it back to like what conference is this? Is this at right? It's it's it's. He thinks it's easy chum. It's easy applause to say the liberals. Yeah, they made us go indoors and quarantine and COVID's a hoax. Whatever. Yeah, it was it was the liberals. That's why I I refused to leave my compound because of the liberals. I would have kept going out of my compound. In fact, I probably would have driven Uber, uh, but it was the liberals. Gavin Newsom wouldn't let me go out and, I don't know, I guess I could have volunteered or maybe just gotten a job at the, the supermarket to provide stuff, but I didn't want to because I couldn't because of Gavin Newsom and they. Was he saying that the French Revolution, like I kind of got lost in his flux capacitor <laughs> stuff, but like the French Revolution, <laughs> He would have gone back that like he would have been conservative back then already. No, he would have he he would have been able to call himself. I think what he's saying is that I could refer to myself as a classical liberal if I lived in France in the, you know, uh, 18th century. 
Okay, but like Edmund Burke is known as the father of conservatism, kind of, right? And he, he was very against the, everything going on in the French Revolution. Well, maybe he would just be there in that era. Uh, and Straight out of the DeLorean. Out of the DeLorean. <laughs> That's where he'd go first. Hey, guys. I noticed that you're chopping off a lot of heads over there, but can you... <laughs> I think that's a little bit against what liberalism I understand it as. <laughs> exactly. You guys have really... Uh, your, your, your liberalism has left mine. I didn't leave you. <laughs> the sans culottes left me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man, he's really playing up. But I like how easily he slips back into stand-up comedy mode there. Yeah, right? You don't think that was easy? Like... The thing about Dave is, like, these people that call themselves stand-up comedians, but they're clearly more famous as online commentators. Oh, well, than, there's but, a, right. that's an audience of, or there's, there's a group of two. Well, yeah. Maybe. Maybe a few more, but yeah. Um, two that I can think of off the top of my head. Never let him see you sweat. Well. Hey, he was really, that was really poor. Like, take your coat off, bud. He, he wanted to really commit to the oily salesman um, vibe he gives off and just pour oil on his face let's uh let's do that neil uh katyal let's do that uh tomorrow that might be something worthwhile to talk about up front uh tomorrow um should we do that uh benny johnson thing oh no let's go to this aoc thing okay um the announcement today by the doj that they're going to step up voter um uh voter protection it's a good thing. I'm glad they're doing it. I'm concerned because I think there is a, there has been over the past couple of days, it feels like a implicit recognition by the administration that like, yeah, we're not going to get any legislation passed. Uh, I mean, it almost feels like they've given up on it. I don't know. Given up is the right word, but they're like moving on to like plan C or D. Here is AOC on Dana Bash, and I get the sense that she feels this way too. AOC does that, like you know, there's no more value in um, in 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 trying to you know like and like placing gifts at the altar of Joe Manchin. Like, exactly, we're, we're, we're past this point. Exactly. Here's AOC on uh, with CNN with uh, Dana Bash this weekend. As you well know, Democrats have three votes to spare in the House. So if the White House comes to you, if Democratic leaders come to you and say. This is the best you're going to get right now. Would you and fellow progressives still say no to this? Well, I think the thing is, is that this isn't the best that we can get. And I do think that we need to talk about the elephant in the room, uh, which is Senate Democrats, which are blocking crucial items in a Democratic agenda um, for very, I think, uh, for reasons that I don't think hold a lot of water. And for folks saying, OK, you know, we need where are you going to get these 50 votes? I think we really need to start asking some of these Democratic senators where they plan on getting 60 votes. Um, these 10 Republican senators that there's a theory that we're going to get support for that out there, um, I think, is 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 a claim that doesn't really hold water, particularly when we can't even get uh, 10 senators to support a January 6th commission. Yeah, no, I hear and you. So generally I think that the speaking. argument that we. But on this particular bill, they have five. And, you know, my understanding is that it is possible if everything comes together, they could get 10. So just on infrastructure. What? <laughs> mm -hmm. you just... Yeah. No, that's so unbelievable to me. She's literally just laid out this premise that it's farcical to think they're going to get 10. And goes, no, I hear you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have this question already teed up uh, about how it needs to be bipartisan. But but here's the point, um, AOC. Five is a number, and so isn't 10. So if they have a number, why couldn't they have 10? Why couldn't five magically turn into 10? If everything comes together, whatever that means. Yes, if everything <laughs> lines up correctly, which means that... If you take five and multiply it by two, that's 10. <laughs> and then they will pass it. It's simple math, AOC. I thought you had an economics degree. <laughs> um, the, the compulsion for uh, the... Do we have a response to that? Mainstream media. Yeah, all right, continue yeah. to play it. 
support a January 6th commission. Yeah, no, I hear and you so generally I think that the speaking, argument that we generally but on this particular bill, they have five. And, you know, my understanding is that it is possible if everything comes together, they could get 10. So just on infrastructure. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I think then the question that we have to make is that there's a fork in the road, which is do we settle for much less and an infrastructure package that has been largely designed by Republicans um, in order to get 60 votes? Or can we really transform this country, create millions of union jobs, revamp our power grid, get people's uh, you know, bridges fixed and schools rebuilt with 51 or 50 uh, Democratic votes? And I think the argument that we need to make here is that it's worth going it alone if we can do more for working people in this country. You know, with 50 votes, we have the potential to lower the age of Medicare eligibility so that more people can be covered and guaranteed to their right to health care, as opposed to, you know, 60 votes where we do very, very little. And the scope of that is defined by a Republican minority that has not been elected to lead. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if like, you know, like the, the me inside of me wants to go like, Dana, are you out of your mind? Or... Well, she goes, my understanding is that it could come like there, there could well, be I... more fight. Your understanding is based in fantasy. Or, or I'd like to say, like, I'd like to hear what the basis of that understanding is. I mean, are you aware? Uh, who yeah, are the other five? Who are the other five Republican yeah. senators? Or I, I mean, I, I honestly am. I don't know if I'm agnostic or ambivalent about this. Or she gets out there and says, like, well, even if you could get the 60, that would be a shitty bill. And why would you do that? Um, I don't know. I know I would say, like, really? Really, Dana? Well, why don't you tell me about that? What is your understanding about those other five? Uh, why aren't they involved yeah. in negotiations? We'll get those with uh, McCarthy's, like, 100 names of communists and high levels of uh, the State Department. Right. Was it your understanding that uh, Kevin McCarthy could say, like, here's my wish list before we ever join this uh, commission? And they say, OK, here's the rubber stamp. Boom. You get your wish list. Nah, sorry, we're not going to do it. I mean, like, the... I, I don't know if the important thing right now is to sort of discipline the media by saying, like, you, you keep doing this and it's a joke. And all you're doing is you're maintaining the fiction that the these 10 people are maintaining, like, uh, you know, they're, they're celebrities. I mean, that's like, the fiction that 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 Dan Abash and CNN is interested in maintaining. The, 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 all, most of the media has always been like this. And it is my contention that the reason why the media could not deal with Donald Trump's lying so much is because for years they would allow like Paul Ryan to lie about like deficit and stuff that was more serious. And they would play this, this game like, Oh, okay. Because everybody knows there is not, unless the Democrats say no new money and you're just going to repurpose the money that we already spent. And even then I just think that like the, the, the Republicans are just not interested in the policy of this. They're just interested in, we're going to deny Joe Biden there's the media is, you know, they talk about propagating the big lie. This is also a lie. This is a this is a lie. There's not going to be 10 votes for, for an infrastructure bill. But, but my understanding is that five equals 10. I don't even convince that the five would vote for it. They wouldn't. They're already like, oh, well, you know, it needs to be what? What's the latest like gang of eight with five of five hundred billion or whatever? The, the gang of maybe? ten. They, gang they, of they, 10. They, they've come out with a bill that is like whatever it is. But I'm not even convinced that they would vote for it if it actually for some reason got up on uh, each end. Right. It's ridiculous. All right. I'm going to read a couple of items and then we're getting out of here. I know it's quick, folks, but that's just the way it is today. You will uh, you won't be mad when I tell you. You know, I, it's baseball related. Anzio action figure. I'd love to watch a Joker like origin story chronicling the adventures of pre majority report Brendan. <laughs> Denver Dave, Sam, unlike you, I have Pomomo, also known as peace of mind missing out, but I still use honey. Honey, left is best. Till, uh, I believe PGT Beauregard statue wasn't put up until 1902. The Civil War ended almost half a century previous reinforcement of culture norms to match the institution Jim Crow legal norms. Also, if I recall correctly, um, PGT Beauregard became more of a political advocate for black civil rights post-Civil War, but that didn't seem to matter to the, new, the racist New Orleans leaders who put up the statue. Um, Tej, Clint is uh, an empathetic but clear 
uh, uh, communicator. We don't need more such voices to actually convince and convert people ra rather than only loud voices that can make a point on Twitter, but do little in terms of impact. <laughs> Uh, Justin, I have heard it all defending the South and the state's rights to horrific humans on beings on pedestals. I've always had the brush off on most lies told because to me, it's no duh stuff, but my statute line was, and I'm paraphrasing, it belongs in a museum. Uh, and Emma Pooh Bounder, Emma Pooh Bounder. The latest New York City uh, mayoral polls are depressing me. The number one issue for people is crime. Adams leads at 23%, Maya Wiley second at 17% after AOC endorsement. Well, that, that, that could be good in terms of like seconds. Remember, like this is the weird thing. You cannot, it's not straightforward polling this time. A square, Sam's as always, thank you for this perspective. My Lord, yes, Emma, if you haven't seen the footage of Angola Rodeo, it's so appalling, like in the plantation, blacks have to entertain too. There's a docu I saw on this years ago and couldn't believe it. There's another layer to this, and it's the overseers of Angola. They, yeah, my sister actually went. She she like covered it for. She wrote her thesis on it, and it was like that's how I know a good amount about it. Yeesh. They have to be told a story to continue to see their lives depend on the subjugation and humiliation of black people. Militant apathy. Uh, I just I, I I asked a tour guide if Jefferson made Sally Helming sleep with the horses like the other slaves. This was 1998. The whole tour was uncomfortable after that. <laughs> Really cool. Ask Clint Smith about Daughters of the Confederacy. Sorry, just saw that. Emma is needed. Genuine question. Please let Emma speak more. Sam, you unintentionally speak over her often. That's not a question. That's, That's a more, statement. And I, it's fine. I, I'm fine with the speaking. When do I? Speaking. I do it intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's kind of the vibe. I speak over you too. Sammy Key, have you got a, uh, heard you got a deal shopping? Hey, Sam, the Don doesn't wear shorts. Uh, Broom Socialist, I had a great Sunset Lake experience. My usual order was delivered in one of the hottest days. All the gummies melted together and fused to the bottle because I was a good customer. They sent me new order great co at no cost. Oh, that's oh, nice. Oh, well, it's great for them. Yeah, they're great guys. Uh, little Chonig. Uh, little Ho Oh, Left Leck Owning. Did you, uh, did you ever do any interviews about what is going on with prices right now? I'm so sick of people in the econ department of my college saying it's because of government's pandemic spending. Um... No, but that's a good idea. Tranche uh, Warfare. Would you hit us with some Hugo? All I'm saying, Ron, is why are you using the chapstick? Got to warm up your vocal cords. Yeah. Train Boy. The real C word is come town. Uh, Dave Parrott. Sam, when will you have my inner ID? Judy Gold back on to discuss mansion and cinema. Effing assholes. Oh, that's a good idea. Cedar's mom. It's always heartwarming to see how happy Em is when she gets off work early. Uh, I bottom, still have work after this. Bottom structure. It's true that if you take uh, the child tax credit of 300 a month that you can no longer claim your children as dependents when filing taxes. Had several people tell me, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm sure you could Google that. Have, your, have you read my email? It seems like Big Food Inspection is silencing the majority report so harshly that Emma isn't allowed to continue the show alone. What does the world come to? Jeff from Atlanta just ordered Clint Smith's book. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. Uh, Bobby F9, claim about school size and student per teacher is wrong. The data doesn't exactly back this up. It's more complicated. That may be the case, but I can tell you my claim about uh, 400 kids on Zoom with a teacher is uh, that is not a recipe <laughs> for learning anything. Uh, Ultra Magnetic MD, Dave just had to make sure that no one would take his Funko Pops and ban him from st cool Star Wars and Back to the Future references before he finally came out as a conservative. And the final I am of the day. <clears throat> Prairie Fire Kowalski. Howdy, folks. In agriculture, new things on average have improved, but not for my area. But nationally, we've got some much-needed rain. West Grain Belt is very dry, but less than uh, productive than the east half. Southwest remains dry, too. I'd recommend looking at the U.S. Drought Monitor to look at the national situation. Sam, Emma, and our crew, I'm feeling generous for your support of Prairie Fire. I'd like to send you some Kowalski Family Farm shirts. Yes. Sam, I understand awesome. all your uh, shirts are farm shirts since you're the real farmer. LOL. I'll email you. Fantastic. Lastly, I was watching a panel. Vouch and Destiny were on yelling about if Bush was fascistic. Vouch said, yes, Destiny was an ass. Being more knowledgeable, being an adult at the time. Sam, what are your thoughts? Left is poggers. I would say Bush was fascistic. I, I wouldn't say he was a fascist, but I yeah. would say there were fascistic tendency of the administration without a doubt. All right, folks, see you tomorrow. Strength I got to get to where